Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. Question number one from Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure that social housing is affordable to tenants. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government does not direct individual social landlords on setting rent levels for their tenancies. Individual social landlords are responsible for setting rents and consultation with their tenants. In doing so, uh, they are required by the Scottish Social Housing Charter to strike a balance between the level of services provided, the cost of the services and how far current and prospective tenants and service us users can afford the rents. This means that each social landlord should be considering the ability of their current and future tenants to afford proposed increases in light of the tenant circumstances. On the issue of mitigating the UK Government's welfare reforms, this year we are spending around £50 million to mitigate the bedroom tax, helping over 70,000 households in the social sector in receipt of housing benefit or universal credit. Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, when I raised this matter last year, the Minister informed me that the Scottish Government would be working with social landlords in 2018 to understand how savings could be made within the affordable housing supply um, that could be reinvested toward, towards keeping rents affordable. After a 6% increase last year, I have a constituent who has again seen his rent increased by 6% this year, with little or no improvements to his own home. This was not the increase consulted on by the Housing Association, but includes a further recalibration of rent structures. He told me that his rent has increased by 30 percent in the last five years. Does the Minister agree with me that action on the affordability of social housing for low-paid workers is urgent? Uh, Minister, and could you also just uh, adjust your microphone, Minister, towards you? Uh, certainly, President Officer. Um, as uh, Ruth uh, Maguire has uh, noted, we as a government are taking an active interest in the issue of affordability. Uh, and for example, in the context of the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, um, and we're currently doing research uh, on this very issue. Uh, the first progress report on child poverty to be published in the summer uh, will set out the progress that we have made on this agenda to date. Uh, I know that social landlord, uh, landlords understand the importance of keeping rents affordable and meeting the needs of the people they serve. Uh, they must get that balance right uh, between the rent levels they set and the level of services that they provide, uh, including the cost of services, as I've seen uh, previously. Uh, they must not increase rents with, without regard uh, to affordability. Um, we'll continue to work with the sector uh, to agree the best ways to keep rents affordable, um, for example, through improving procurement capability to deliver efficiencies. I'm more than willing to meet with Ms. McGuire to discuss the issues around about uh, this particular constituent uh, to make sure that um, the constituent has had a, a financial health check to make sure that he is getting everything that he is entitled to, uh, and, to be on th and beyond that to discuss uh, the matters around about the Housing Association uh, that she has talked about. And Graeme Simpson. Thanks. Um, Ruth McGuire has raised a, a really important issue here. Um, but of course, uh, one of the ways to um, keep rents down or to keep them in check would be to build more social housing. Um, the government's committed to build 35,000 uh, houses for social rent. Yet in the first two uh, years of this parliament, only 8,500, according to the government's own figures, were built way off target. So can the minister say um, how he hopes to get the programme back on track? Minister. Um, first of all, uh, President Officer, in terms of uh, rent affordability, uh, here in Scotland in 2016-17, uh, rents in uh, uh, housing associations were some 18% lower uh, than, in, uh, than in England uh, and 21% lower for local authority homes. So there's a big difference between SNP-run Scotland uh, and Tory-run uh, England in this regard. In terms of the housing programme, uh, the housing programme is on track. Uh, we have said that we will deliver 50,000 affordable homes 35,000 of those for social rent. We are on track to do so. Um, and uh, I'm sure that Mr. Simpson uh, knows that's the case because I pontificate it about it quite a, a, a bit. Um, so we will continue to deliver what is the biggest housing programme since the 1970s, uh, unlike uh, what is happening south of the border, where they do not seem to have the same ethos as us in terms of the delivery of social housing. Yeah. Yeah. Question number three, Liam Kerr. 
Asks the Scottish Government how many local authority providers in the North East provide 1,140 hours of funded childcare. Minister Marie Todd. Every three and four year old and eligible two year old is entitled to 1140 hours of funded early learning and childcare from August 2020. At the moment, the legal entitlement is 600 hours. No local, local authority is under legal obligation to offer 1140 hours yet. Local authorities have been asked to phase in the expanded offer and to ensure that those children who stand to gain the most from extra funded hours are the first to benefit. So currently, 22 local authority settings in the North East, comprising Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, Angus, Dundee and Murray, are offering 1140 hours. A further 38 local authority settings in the North East will be phasing in and delivering the extended provision later this year. Liam Kerr. I thank the Minister for that answer. President Officer, we're well over halfway point in the expansion of childcare provision to the 1,140 hours. Uh, but, and here I'm happy to help the Minister. In fact, in the North East, Freedom of Information requests have revealed only eight out of 222 public childcare centres are offering the target of 1,140. That's eight out of 222. So to reassure parents who are feeling let down and show the Minister's confidence uh, in the delivery of the target, will the Minister commit to resigning? if she fails to deliver the 1,140 hours at Minister. every public childcare centre in the North East by 2020. Minister. So to reassure the member again, I am absolutely confident that in 18 months' time, when the local authorities are legally obliged to deliver 1140 hours of free childcare, they will be. Let me assure you, we are on target and we are going to deliver this transformative programme. Let me reassure the member further because the member restricted his question to local authority settings as well as the local authority settings which are already providing 1140 hours. An estimated 77 partner providers are currently delivering the expanded entitlement of 1140 hours and at least an additional 22 partner providers are expected to do so from August this year. If I were building a bridge, you would not expect to be driving over it 18 months before it was built. <laughs> <laughs> Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer, and let's not forget that it's the Tories that are in charge of Aberdeenshire Council. Yeah. On Friday, I visited Hoodle's Nursery in Old Meldrum, one of many private partner provider nurseries gearing up for 1140 hours provision. Can I ask the Minister what she's doing to ensure that partner providers and childminders are included in the free childcare revolution and that parents get to choose the best type of provision that suits them and their children? Marie Todd. Our provider neutral funding follows the child approach will empower parents and carers to choose from a range of high quality providers, including childminders and private and third sector settings. The power is well and truly in the parents' hands to choose the type of childcare that suits their child and their family best. And the provider just has to meet the national standard and have a place available. Our multi-year funding agreement will enable local authorities to pay sustainable rates to funded providers by 2020. We're committed to supporting providers in the transition to 2020. We know they'll be absolutely crucial to our success. Our delivery support plan builds on support already available, such as the 100% business rates relief and sets out further actions to support providers. Meaningful partnership working between providers and local authorities is key to ensuring choice for parents and carers. The ELC Partnership Forum, established with COSLA, is helping to share good practice and we're going to hold a partnership summit this summer as we approach one year to go. And Willie Coffey. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what progress has been made by the local authorities to adjust payment frequencies? to private, voluntary sector and home-based providers to encourage both local and national sustainability of the 1140 hours? Yes. A key, a key aspect of our funding follows the child approach to be introduced in 2020, August 2020, is that local authorities ensure that funded providers are paid promptly and efficiently for delivering the funded entitlement. 
That will support the sustainability of funded providers and ensure healthy cash flows. As a minimum, it's expected that local authorities should look to pay a funded provider within 30 days of the start of term and preferably much sooner. The timing of the payment should be stipulated in the agreement between the local authority and the funded provider or in the general conditions governing terms of business. There are already examples of local authorities um, with prompt payment practices. And as I said, we're encouraging the sharing of good practice through the Knowledge Hub. Question number four, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce air pollution in North Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government works closely with all local authorities in Scotland on reducing air pollution. Financial and other support is provided to authorities to assist them with monitoring and to our necessary actions to improve air quality. And the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy sets out a series of actions for government, Transport Scotland, local authorities and others to further reduce air pollution across all areas of Scotland. An independent review of the strategy is currently ongoing. Jamie Green. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but clearly one of the main drivers of reducing air pollution in towns across North Ayrshire and right across Scotland will be improving the uptake of low emission vehicles. So on that point, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how many charging points has this government installed in North Ayrshire? If that information is not available in the Chamber now, I'd be happy to have it in writing later. And how confident is she that the government is going to meet its 2032 target, given that uh, new car sales of low-emission vehicles is only 6% at the moment? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member knows that probably is a question which ought to be directed towards my transport colleagues. However, I can advise him um, that uh, uh, action is being taken in this regard in uh, North Ayrshire. Um, and there are currently 12 electric vehicle charge points in place with six uh, further vehicle charge points uh, being, uh, uh, being uh, installed. Uh, so I think he should be reassured that the uh, work on vehicle charge points is ongoing. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, vehicle, uh, elect, low emission vehicle uptake uh, is a matter for all aspects of society. It's not something government can uh, uh, absolutely direct and I hope that he will join me in encouraging all car owners when they're thinking about new purchases to consider uh, low emission vehicles as a purchase. And Kenneth Gibson. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. Can the minister tell us how air quality and indeed air quality targets in Scotland compare to those in the rest of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Well, they compare particularly favourably, as you might uh, uh, imagine. Um, there's uh, a, a particular target which uh, the Scotland is the first country in Europe to have adopted uh, in terms of uh, legislating and that's the fine uh, particulate target and that of course is the one that gives us the biggest concern in respect of uh, the impacts on health of air pollution. Uh, we compare well with the rest of the UK um, and we're fully compliant with EU requirements for fine particulate matter. Question number five, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the operation of the Town Centre Fund. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The £50 million Town Centre Fund, which I announced in the budget, has been developed in partnership with COSLA and was launched on the 1st of March. The fund will be distributed across all local authorities to enable them to stimulate and support a wide range of investments which encourage town centres and city neighbourhoods to diversify and flourish. The distribution of the fund was agreed jointly by its Scottish Government and COSLA leaders. It will be for local authorities to allocate this fund against the themes of the Town Centre Action Plan. Annabelle Ewing. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and I also thank him warmly for allocating the highest amount of funding, in fact, under the Fund 25 Council, some £4.3 million. But as the MSP for Cowden Beath constituency, can the Cabinet Secretary clarify how I can ensure that towns in my constituency get their fair share of this very welcome Scottish Government funding? Cabinet Secretary. Can I, first of all, welcome the warm welcome from Annabel Ewing of these uh, resources? I think they will be transformative for our town centres. The exact figure for Fife, to be precise, is £4,335,000. It will be for local authorities to determine the distribution, but the campaign to ensure that there is fairness for every part of the constituency uh, that Annabel Ewing represents, I think, has already begun, and the Council will be very well aware of that position, but it will be a matter for them to determine the distribution of that fund. Thank you. Question number six, Claire Baker. 
to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to deal with asbestos-related illnesses and how it supports people with these conditions. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government expects NHS boards to provide high-quality, person-centred care for all people, including those with suspected or confirmed diagnosis of asbestos-related conditions. The Scottish Government's cancer strategy, Be Beating Cancer, Ambition and Action, was launched in March 2016 alongside a commitment to spend £100 million over five years to improve the prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment and aftercare of those affected by all forms of cancer and that of course includes those who have an asbestos related cancer. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for the answer. In presiding officer, today I am hosting Tayside Asbestos Action Group in Parliament and I know from personal experience how much support they give to people living with asbestos related conditions including mesothelioma and their families and I thank them for their work. There remains concern that a postcode lottery exists when it comes to people receiving the medical or pastoral care they need and deserve. What is the Scottish Government doing to bridge the gaps in provision and raise awareness among health and social workers of the soft support which is available and the importance of signposting people to these vital services? Minister. Thank, thank the member for that question and recognise her personal commitment to this area of work and also recognise the, the, the work of um, Tayside um, Action Against Asbestos. Um, I think the member makes a really important point. Um, so we've recently published um, a revised Scottish referral guideline for suspected cancer um, on the 22nd of January. So the, the purpose of that is to make sure that we, we have that consistency. So the referral guidelines for suspected cancer will help ensure clinicians have access to the most up-to-date evidence um, to, to, to refer patients with symptoms um, suspicious of cancer onto the right pathway at the right time but I'm, I absolutely recognise the, the work of organisations such as those in, in, the, in the gallery and happy to continue working with the member on an issue that I know is of personal importance to her. And question number seven, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government when it will put together an economic plan for Dundee. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Uh, we have a national economic strategy and action plan which we are delivering for Scotland and we're working with local and regional partners to help build the kind of long-term, resilient and inclusive economic growth that Dundee needs in order to thrive. Jenny Mara. Presiding Officer, Dundee has lost 850 jobs at Michelin, over 200 just in the city at McGill, will lose over 300 at HMRC on top of the many smaller businesses that have closed. On Monday, 4th and Tay decommissioning will launch, but we have still to see the jobs materialise, and I note that there is to be no government presence at this event. I believe this government has a responsibility to its voters in Dundee to urgently prioritise our city for new economic opportunities. Will the Cabinet Secretary publish a Dundee jobs plan this autumn, and can he please commit to that today? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we do have an economic strategy, we have an economic action plan and that's what this government's about, delivering the actions necessary to grow our economy and create jobs across Scotland. But specifically for Dundee, as Jenny Mara knows very well, when Michelin took the decision to leave Scotland, I got involved and sure we recalibrated entire efforts to ensure that Michelin stays in Dundee and that's what they committed to do because of the actions of this government and our partners. And that was significant. In relation to some of the public sector jobs that Jenny Mara has spoken about, HMRC pulling out of Dundee, was it not the Labour Party that joined with the Conservatives to say that to save civil service jobs, people had to vote against Scottish independence and still were losing those jobs as part of the union? On the other hand, the Scottish Government is delivering 750 new jobs for Dundee through the creation of the Social Security Agency. Further actions for Dundee. There has been industrial difficulties. Our agencies have got involved to try and support the Dundee economy. We'll continue to do so, but with the Scottish Government, Dundee gets action. From the Labour Party, they get empty rhetoric. Question 8, Richard Lyle. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to encourage companies to establish more apprenticeships. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, we encourage companies to provide uh, apprenticeship opportunities, of which there will be 29,000 next year, up from 28,000 this year. 
uh, through a variety of means such as promotional activity in Scottish Apprenticeship Week, through developing the young workforce regional groups, an activity undertaken by the Scottish Apprenticeship Advisory Board, Skills Realm Scotland also undertake a range of promotional activity selling the benefits of apprenticeships to employers and individuals. Richard Lyle. Can I, thank, uh, can I compliment the Minister for his drive in more modern apprentices? And I note that the new target has been set by the Scottish Government for next year of over 29,000. Last week I visited Saltide Heating Systems in Belsill. They're taking on apprentices, have 30 apprentices, nearly 12% of the workforce. I hope other firms will take their lead. As people retire, we need more apprentices to take up the slack right across the range for every company from drivers to plumbers to bricklayers. So my question to the Minister is, what steps can the Scottish Government take to ensure that we have the correct range of apprentices, both male and female, that Scotland requires to meet our future needs to grow as a country? Jamie Hepburn. Can I uh, begin by congratulating Saltire Heating Systems for making exactly the type of contribution we need to see uh, employers make? We will continue to undertake the activity uh, we do, uh, President Officer, increasing uh, the number of apprenticeship opportunities, but also ensuring that our system is responsive uh, to employer need. That's exactly the system we have in bed. Now we'll continue to engage empl with employers to ensure our apprenticeship offer uh, responds to the needs of our economy and society. Uh, Mr Lowe can be assured of that, as can every member in this chamber. Thank you very much. And uh, before we turn to First Minister's questions, uh, could I invite uh, colleagues to join me in welcoming to our gallery the Honourable Ted Arnott, the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. <laughs> 